this really is a presentation that stems from some work that uh, uh, Dr. Kolmansberger and I have uh, done a couple of times. And uh, when people saw it, they said, you really should do this at the forum. And so it is really an interview situation. And I would like to in introduce you now to another one of our board members. And that is um, Dr. Actually, Dr. Mona Sabawa, but uh, she's uh, on our board for a year now, and uh, she's going to moderate this next section. So let's say hi to Mona. Okay. Um, well, uh, good morning, still, everybody. We're going to walk through some questions with Dr. Christian Kohlsman Berger and Stephen, Andrew. Um, Dr. Colesman Berger is a medical oncologist in Vancouver, um, and I believe Stephen's medical oncologist. Does, yeah, that's right. And as you know, Stephen is our fearless leader here at Kidney Cancer Canada, our executive director. And we're gonna talk about one of the most crucial relationships during your, your cancer experience, um, that of your physician and, um, and you. So we're gonna to get to know uh, Dr. Colesman Berger a little bit, and then we're gonna talk about kind of his perspective on that doctor-physician, or doctor-patient relationship. So we'll start with you, Dr. Colesman Berger. Tell us a little bit about yourself and um, how you got to know Stephen. Um, yeah, so I'm a medical oncologist in Vancouver. Um, I came to Vancouver in 2004. My accent is not South African, it's actually German. Um, um, I, I trained in Germany, got all my training done in Germany, and then in 2004, I uh, took a position at the Cairns Agency. And uh, when I came to Vancouver in 2004, that was still the uh, dark ages of kidney cancer, um, because there was not really any, any working treatment. And uh, because of that, kidney cancer was not very popular among oncologists, and when I arrived, um, somebody said, you know, who's going to do kidney cancer? And nobody really volunteered. And since I was the new kid of the block and I always thought that kidney cancer was interesting, I said, well, I can do it. And uh, um, it's one of those moments in life where, where all of a sudden you do something and then it turns out to be a, a pretty interesting move because today kidney cancer is one of the most interesting fields in oncology. So I've been in Vancouver since 2004 and uh, my two my two um, major foci of interest is kidney cancer and then testicular cancer for young men. And uh, I met Stephen in 2007, um, in April 2007, when he came to my um, clinic for a second opinion. And I'm pretty sure we're gonna talk about that a little bit. Um, and since then, um, I had the honor of uh, accompanying Stephen throughout his, uh, this journey um, of kidney cancer and, uh, um, and uh, have been closely involved in, uh, in uh, the uh, development of Kidney Cancer Canada as well. Tell us how you first of all build rapport with your patients and then tell us about that re unique kind of relationship that you have because it's beyond, I guess, just the usual doctor-patient relationship? Well, yes, for sure. I mean, it's certainly not the, the, the normal patient-physician uh, relationship. Simply, for, I mean, the, the, for a number of reasons. A, Stephen is a very unusual patient. Um, in case of you, in, in, in case you have not noticed yet, but no does not mean a lot for Stephen. It only means I have to try a bit harder. Um, <laughs> Um, and as I always say, Stephen is not only an investigative journalist by profession, he's an investigative journalist by nature. Um, he's very curious and wants to know everything and then, and then uh, asks, if need be, very uncomfortable questions. And, uh, and I think one of the aspects why it became such an interesting and, and I mean, friendship in, at, at the end, um, is because Stephen really got into it, and, and he is now the executive director of Kidney Cancer Canada. And, uh, and Stephen was also very instrumental uh, in BC moving kidney cancer forward. I'm sure we're going to talk about that um, as well at some point. But, but I remember that clearly that uh, uh, when Stephen came to me um, to, for a second opinion, um, 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 he... Uh, he told me about what happened. I had read up on his case, and, and uh, then I discussed with him what, what I would do. 
and uh, so we changed his treatment of it. And then, and then in that year, um, um, Stephen was still working, and uh, and he had um, uh, the health minister of BC in his radio show, and he basically cornered the health minister to the point that the health minister promised us to fund Zunetinib, which at that point was up in the air. So that was a very, a very interesting moment. How do we build a rapport with our patients? Um, what do I do? Um, so when I usually uh, get a new patient with kidney cancer, well, first of all, I get, I get uh, to know all the facts. You read the chart, you try to get as much information as possible, and then you meet the patient. And I think when I see a patient, one of the basic things is that I, I already know at that point, it's not gonna be a one, a one hour show. Um, to build rapport with your patient takes a while, and, and you, cannot, you cannot do that in an hour. The first hour is basically to get to know the patient, to introduce yourself, to introduce what the situation is, and that is usually, and, and I always recognize that, and I, I tell that patient, I said, you know, I'm gonna totally overload you with information because unfortunately that's the nature of our business, but rest assured, you will have a phone number, we will have more appointments, and you will get you will get to know your situation in detail and why we are doing things and the way we are doing things. And you will literally become a little expert. That's, that's usually my goal. I want my patients as informed as possible. Um, that costs me more time in the beginning probably because um, you know uh, it's a lot of questions. But in the end, I think it, 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 makes, it, it, it allows you to achieve a much better outcome simply because the patient knows why we are doing things and, uh, and it, it's a much better relationship to move that whole journey forward. I think, you know, um, Christian said that uh, I uh, am uh, strange. I am. Um, <laughs> the, the thing is, and uh, I know for me is just another word in op another opportunity, so uh, I just Keep, keep moving forward, and, and Steve was talking about attitude. It's, hu it's a huge, uh, huge thing in, in my care. So uh, uh, if you don't leave with anything other than these next few words uh, from here today, uh, that's fine. Second opinions can save your life. And I say that, I mean it, my original oncologist uh, I was started on Sutent. I had metastatic disease, so I had a kid, my kidney out in 2006. I had partial my lung out in the beginning of 2007. Then we discovered metastatic disease all the way through my lungs. And uh, I went on Sunitinib, Sutent. And I went, originally went on the original dose, and you've got to realize this back in 2007. So I just want to say that the things I'm, you need to consider, what I'm telling you is within the context of 11 years ago, which is... It, it's important, right, Christian? Because things that happen today don't, didn't happen then. And um, my oncologist was going to take me off and hadn't listened to a couple of other things that I had mentioned, some pain, some other things that gone on. And uh, my first dose, I started to get a bit of a sore throat at the back, but I didn't know whether it was a sore throat or whether it was actually the medication. And the oncologist literally was jumping up and down in the room, getting my husband to come over and say, look at his throat, look at his throat. Oh, we're going to have to take him off the drug. And um, she left the room for a moment, I'm assuming, because maybe to recover from the shock of what she saw in my throat, which was nothing, but anyway. Um, she then, uh, Danny turned to me, my husband turned to me, and he said, uh, Stephen, I want you to get a second opinion. This woman is going to kill you. And so then I went to, got my second opinion, talking to Christian. He did spend a long time with me, answered a lot of questions. But um, I had said, you know, you can be as aggressive as you want with my treatment uh, care pathway. I, I, take me to the edge of death and back if you have to. I'm prepared to go there. And the, my first oncologist didn't believe it. And everyone said, oh, no, you can go get a, a second opinion. Everything's going to be fine. And then I decided, obviously, I was going to go and see Christian. And we upped the dosage to 50. And I took the drug eventually uh, 28 days on, seven days off. 
and Dr. Georg Berenson convinced me to take it at nighttime, and so I did that too. Um, but it really was the, the relationship between us right from the beginning. He was somebody that was open and listening to what I was saying, would laugh at my bad jokes, and wouldn't mind ans answering the difficult questions. And so that's how, how it really started. And um, you didn't criticize the other doctor, you just said, I would do it differently. And that's what happened. I think I used the word <clears throat> interesting. And I said, what does that mean? <laughs> interesting. Because when I use it, it means that's not good. <laughs> and can, uh, he said, well, it's interesting. I would never I think, criticize another doctor's uh, treatment plan. I think to the day I have not given you the definition of that interesting. Um, <laughs> medicine is not an exact science. N nothing in medicine adds up to 100%. There's always, there's always room for, for interpretation. It's a very special field, oncology, um, which, which is scary to a lot of physicians who are not dealing with it on a daily basis. Um, and, and kidney cancer is a relatively rare tumor, and sunitinib back then was really not known at all. Um, it was really only known to a certain uh, small group of, of experts who had participated in the development of these drugs. So, um, um, and, and I think it is important to realize that, um, I think for, for me as a, a physician, I, I want my patient to ask me a lot of questions because I want my patient to be informed, I want the patient to understand why we are doing things. And I think that's important for a patient perspective um, that, that you must feel comfortable with, even if it's bad information, you, you still must be comfortable with how to go forward. And I think from a, from a physician perspective, and that's what I do, I, I never go into a patient room without a plan. I think it's important to have a plan and to... to you, you had a plan? Pardon me? You had a plan? Yeah. Yeah. There used to be. I know that you don't believe that, but I do. No. Anil never believes that either, but, but I do. Anil <laughs> says you make it up on the spot. <laughs> Um, well, you may have to adjust your plan once you get to know your patient. Yes. I mean, that's true. <laughs> that is true. Because you have to take into account what the patient wants and what the patient does not want. And you have to read your patient a little bit. I go in and I ask him how they are, and, and we talk a little bit. And then I ask the question, what do you know about your situation? Because for me, that's the, the central question of the first interview. Because the response to that question tells me, where do I have to start? And I'm always flabbergasted when patients come with the diagnosis of metastatic kidney cancer, and then they tell me, well, I have kidney cancer. And I said, and? And nothing. So then how do you have that conversation around what does metastatic disease mean? Well, then I start from the beginning, and I tell patients, you know, you were diagnosed with this kidney cancer. It was taken out, but it has spread to the lungs, and then we go step by step through the evolution of the disease and what it means for treatment and what the treatment goals are and what treatments are available. And that's why I say it's information overload. It's always good if patients bring somebody to listen, another, another pair of ears. Um, but I, I, I try to, I, I know that, and I try to reassure the patient and say, you know, you will, if you go home and you have burning questions, give my office a call, I call you back, or we make another appointment, we will go through that set of questions and the process several times until you understand that. Yeah, and they can also come to like the KCC website to get some, or the forum to be able to well, get yeah, some Yeah, and you know, I mean, one of the things, uh, some of the things that we do now at Kidney Cancer Canada really basically came from uh, my experience as a patient wanting to get information so that you need information when you get that diagnosis. So now we, we send patient information kits to everybody that that is diagnosed or wants them. We put more information up on the website. If patients call in uh, with specific questions, uh, I mean, and honestly, I can give you a couple of examples. I, I'm constantly sending texts or calling a Neil or a Christian and saying to him, hey, patients petrified, this is happening. And very often they will say, have them call me or I will call them. Or Christian, some, a patient would come into your office literally the day before I flew out here, and I was literally in the, in the car coming to, to the airport, and the, the guy had called us, and I said, who's your doctor? He said, Dr. Coleman's but I saw his fellow, and I'm worried about this, and I said, 
I'm pretty sure knowing Dr. Colmansberger, it's not serious, otherwise he would have been in the room with you. But I sent him a text, and five minutes later, you were on the phone calming him down. Yeah. Like, that, that, is, that is, I mean, a standard of care that is many people in this room probably may not have seen, but I'll tell you this, the clinicians that are engaged in their work, and it's about the patients, that they care about the patients. We're going to open it up to the audience in a, in a second. Yeah. Um, Christian, I'd just like to ask you one question before we open it up, and I'll ask you, Stephen, one question. Um, what is one of the hardest things you do in your practice? What do you want this audience to know, some of the, the, the challenges you deal with, but what's the hardest? I think the hardest for, for, for me is if, if, if I have to talk to the patient about, about the, the, the whole disease and, and, um, and even with everything we can do these days, you know, not every story ends well. And those are very difficult conversations. Um, um, for us, as, I mean, primarily for the patient, but, but for us as well, it's because you build a, a special bond with your patient. I mean, oncology, one of the, one of the uh, things which draw me, drew me to oncology initially was this quite intense patient-physician relationship, which is certainly different from an ophthalmologist who sees you once a year and checks out your eyes and then that's it. I mean, it's a journey which your oncologist and you take together. And, uh, and I, I, I've built a bond with my patients and, and if that is cut at some point, that, that is difficult. And Stephen, you know, you've been on your journey for quite, quite some time, which is amazing. Um, what is one thing, though, if you could tell folks in this room, um, that you, looking back, that you've learned? You need to advocate for yourself, and then when you've done that, you need to advocate for yourself again. And when you hear no, remember that is no within the context, maybe, of the time and the geography of where you're located. Um, at the time, uh, I had a lesion that, after we went through everything, I had a lesion that grew on my spine, and this was not being done in BC at the time. This was been 2008, but um, Christian found a study at Princess Margaret, so I came here and got stereotactic radiation. And you know, and I always say to people, there's hope, and I know I'm, I am a weird case because uh, now I'm, I no longer take suit, and I have been taking it for seven years and I'm on absolutely no form of uh, therapy whatsoever, and, I, and there's no evidence of disease. And I know that that is very, very rare. It's not uh, common. But I will tell you, I think a lot of it was uh, advocating for myself and ensuring that I was getting the best level of treatment. And the hardest thing that I have to deal with uh, as uh, the executive director is hearing patient stories where I know that the standard of care that they are receiving is not what it could be, that it, it could could be better, or that they're not as educated as they need to be, or they've undergone an unnecessary surgery from the discussion that we've had because they've been in a smaller center, and well, they don't have the right information. So that's really the toughest thing I, I have to deal with right now. So we're gonna take any questions from the audience. Um, like to hear some experiences you may have had with your clinician and. Um, we get some advice from folks up here on how you can approach things differently to get what you need out of your out of your relationship. So if anyone has any questions. Everybody here and everybody in cancer needs to be empowered them they to empower themselves to stay alive, if that's what they want, obviously. Um, it's not easy on students, we all know, you know, and it, it carries on through you know, I had a heart attack in February. Cardiologists know nothing about cancer. Uh, they, they say, well, were you, to were you told that, um, you know, you're going to have a heart attack because of Sutant? You know, the, the, the side effects from Sutant are tremendous, yeah? Pfizer, there's not enough detail about, you know, um, and everybody's not enough detail about side effects. So um, everybody needs to empower themselves to go and find that information. And it's not the same for each individual. It's totally different, and that's the thing. There isn't one magic wand that every, these doctors have got. It's a case of you have to go find out who's the best guy and where's the best treatment for you, because cancer is different for everybody. 
Thank you. Yeah, I think, I think th that really is extremely important, um, that patients try to get as much information, and if need be, maybe get a second opinion in a center which has potentially more experienced centers which do clinical trials. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I think that is extremely important that you get engaged because as you say, you know, um, it's not everywhere the same and every patient is unique. Um, I always say when, when patients come and say, well, my neighbor had chemotherapy and I know how bad it is, um, that's a statement like I tell you I drive a car. That can be a Porsche 911 or a Chevy pickup truck. So there are huge differences, and every patient is individual and unique, and the treatment has to be tailored accordingly. Maybe my question is not as ap applicable to this part of the uh, session, but I had a, um, a persistent cough for at least 14 months before that after I had it for about six months, I started to pursue to see what it was. My, my kids were very concerned. I could hardly finish a sentence without coughing. And I had, uh, I had scopes both ways and everything, and everybody told me everything was fine until my uh, hemoglobin was low, and my GP said, let's do a, a CAT scan. Uh, long story short, I'm, the day after my surgery, I had a, a radical nephrectomy, the day after my surgery, my cough was gone. We had Googled persistent cough, um, and it came up with lung cancer possibilities, everything else, but we never Googled uh, cough and kidney cancer. So I think cough as a standalone symptoms for, kidney, for localized kidney cancer, that would indeed be very unusual. Um, what's a lot more likely is if somebody has a persistent cough, and I think that's where you need to do your due diligence. If you have a cough for six months and you can barely finish a sentence, I think that warrants an X-ray and a CT scan and, and, and a workup of your lung. Um, and, and, and then in most of these cases, you will find something. And for anyone who's just starting this journey, that is exactly what you want it to look like. Respect, compassion, conversation, <coughs> understanding, and I just had to get up and say that. And I just have one question. Uh, I know you're from Vancouver? Yes. Yes? Have you ever been to the East Coast? <laughs> I've never been to Newfoundland. Uh, the reason I'm asking is that, you know, we, we need some help out there. <laughs> and yes, you, you can't have him. He's <laughs> mine. I don't want him, but and I'm not moving. Could, if we could borrow him for a day or two, we would really, really appreciate it. I know firsthand that when you find that right doctor, what a difference it can make to your journey yeah. and your mentality and your drive to, to Deal with it. We'll do it. We'll do it. It's done. That's it's done. Squeak, the squeaky wheel gets the grease, so yeah. I intend and I'm, to And I'm pretty sure many, many of us in our group who work with Kidney Cancer Canada, whether it's Dr. Kapoor, Dr. Canelo, myself, we are certainly happy to come out and, and, and work with you. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, for me, the biggest thing to tell people is to get copies of all your reports. I went with after my cancer, uh, which I'll talk about this afternoon, but I went with my mom for an osteoporosis appointment with her GP. She'd had some scans, and I asked for a copy. They talked only about her osteo. And uh, as I'm glancing over, the bottom of the report says, incidental finding of a mass on her kidney. So I said to her GP, you know, oh, what about this mass that says it should be followed? That's nothing, she said. I said, well, sorry, that's not good enough for me. And my mom had a uh, scan and it was, in fact, a uh, renal cell. So because it was only stage two, she just had a partial and was, was finished with it. She's just followed with ultrasound. But, you know, she was in her 60s. Had I have not said something, that would have been in her chart. And that would mm. have been the end of that until you know, she progressed. I, I totally agree with you getting your reports. I, I, we did the same, and uh, as Christian knows, this, I wish I could say this was an isolated incident. Uh, in the past six weeks, we've had two cases. We had large tumors, 10 centimeters and 14.5 centimeters were missed by a radiologist. I don't know how, I mean, how 
It could be missed on a report. And we have another case of another GP out in eastern Canada who uh, the patient had metastatic disease and then discovered that uh, about 10 to 12 months earlier that he had had a CT. He was told it was all clear, and his GP missed the, uh, the, the uh, description of the, the tumor. And the doctor said to the patient, uh, it's only the second time in 40 years that I've missed something. And uh, that, was, that was how it was dealt with. So I'm not saying it, it's rampant, but uh, Christian, talk a bit about the study that we were, we were talking about reading radiology. Uh, we, we actually, our conversation stemmed from this misreading. The, the study out of the States about um, uh, ra radiation oncologists or, or uh, radio? No, there, there's, there's actually studies that uh, um, if scans are reviewed by an oncologically expert radiologist, that that can in up to 40% influence what, what physicians do. Uh, I, have a, I have a bad habit. My radiologists don't really love me for that, but I, I am almost daily in their office to look at CT scans with them because I'm a very visual type and I need to see that. And it, it's always amazing how much you can learn and how much you more understand when you actually go with the radiologist who knows the background of the disease through those scans. So I, I think that's, for me, that's very important. Uh, one thing I wanted to say about the copying of the reports. Um, if you do that, yes, that's a good idea. But you then have to really, you, you have to be aware that they can sound very, very scary. Yeah? Be prepared that you may read something which you really, which shocks you. You've got to talk to your physician about that because uh, that is something which I often experience that it needs to be put into context and needs to be interpreted by somebody who does that. And Dr. Google cannot do that for you. Um, the problem with Dr. Google is that Dr. Google cannot tell you which website really provides valuable information, which, which website does not. And that's a big problem. I just wanted to mention that PubMed might be the best place to look for medical research. It's credible, it's free, it's easy, it's better than Google. And then the other thing is that patient portals, anybody who can get their medical records online through a patient portal, then it's instantaneous. You have it weeks before you see your doctor and you can organize yourself. And then I wanted to tell my own radiology story where uh, I, when I saw a third resident, they said, in fact, there's no kidney on the, on the slide that the radiologist decided is having a suspicious renal cell. And I tracked it down to the radiologist who did the report, and he amended it six months after he did the report, and then backdated the amendment to the date of the, the original test. And I called again and complained and got the proper date put on the amendment. But then my doctor had a panic attack when he saw this, and he went, oh, no, it's been amended, and there really is a tumor. And uh, so I think it's important for patients to read those things. And patients have an interest, and they can catch errors that doctors might, might miss. I realize they deal in very high numbers. And many doctors, I found out, are not checking the report ever. They're, they're just going with the, uh, with the written material, and they never look at a slide. So anyway. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for sharing your, your thoughts, your comments, and, uh, and your experiences, because that's actually how we learn. Um, and thank you to Dr. Christian Kolsmanberger and uh, Stephen for sharing. Thank their you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Very much. Thank you.